just want to start with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here this evening. And as we come here to worship you, Lord, I ask that you hide me behind the cross. I'm unworthy to speak words from your, from your holy word, Lord, but you have given us humans a privilege of speaking for you. And I ask that you touch my lips, touch the hearts that are here today, and may we see you more clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a story of a church. It's called Soul Survivor. And the pastor of this church, his name is Mike Pilavachi, And he tells this great story of what happened within his own church. Something that turned their whole church upside down. I'm going to read you this short account of what happened. He says, At first it was difficult to put our finger on the problem. On the surface, everything was just fine. The musicians were tuning their instruments. The sound men were getting out of bed on time. That's good. Each service contained a block of songs that focused on the cross and gave people the chance to get down to business with God. To make things easier, the music was up to date, not those old hymns. The chairs had disappeared and the lights were low. What better atmosphere for young people to worship God? Then one day it clicked. We had become connoisseurs of worship instead of participants of it. In our hearts, we were giving the worship team grades on a scale of 1 to 10. Not that song again. I can't hear the bass. I like the way she sings a lot better. We had made the band the performers of worship and ourselves the audience. We had forgotten that we are all the performers of worship and that God is the audience. We were challenged to ask ourselves individually, when I come through that door of the church, what am I bringing as my contribution to worship? And the truth came to us. Worship is not a spectator sport. It is not a product molded by the taste of its consumers. It is not about what we can get out of it. It's all about God. And we needed to take drastic action. For a while, in order to truly learn this lesson, They banned having a band. Then they just sat around in circles, and if no one brought a sacrifice of praise, they would spend the entire meeting in silence. At the beginning, they virtually did. No words were said. Everyone was scared. We're not here to say anything. We're here to be entertained. And it was a very painful process. They were learning again not to rely on the music. After a while, they began to have some very sweet times of worship. They all began to bring their prayers, their readings, their thanksgiving, and their praises and songs. At one point, someone would start, a, start singing a song a cappella, and everyone would join in. The excitement came back, and they realized they were not having church. They were meeting once again with God. I wish our churches could sometimes go through that kind of transformation instead of relying on something else. Tonight my sermon is entitled, or my devotion is entitled, Back to Worship. And it's going to be very simple. We're going to go over four questions today. The first question is, why do we come to worship? Why do we come to worship? Now, if I were to just venture out to take a guess, it may not be you that are here that these answers pertain to. Unfortunately, when you have 25 minutes of time, 25 minutes of time, you can't go through everything. This is a general statement, so please don't get offended. But there are some people that do come to worship because their friends are there. Maybe they meet each other and they enjoy the fellowship part of worship. That's great. Others come because a significant other or a parent force them to. Others come just because they have nothing else to do, and they're just looking to get points with God. And the thing is, those are not bad reasons. We should still come. And when I, when I continue speaking of this, please don't get me wrong. We're not talking about those that come to church for the first time, and God touches their heart. I'm talking about those seasoned veterans, those of you that I've seen for many years, that if you've seen me, and we've sat in the pews, and we've gotten comfortable. And we've gotten real comfortable. We know we have that spot in the church. Like, how could someone sit in my spot? Don't they know I sit there? See, Jesus had it all clear. 
In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, he says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. You see, you can sing the song and you can read the scripture, but God wants the heart. Granted, even with the motives that I mentioned, that you come for friends or someone just brought you and um, you didn't want to come but you came anyway, those are good things. Those, we, should still, we should still come and worship God in his sanctuary. Because our God is awesome. That although we may have the wrong motives, he can break us down and get into that little crack that we left out in our heart and the seed starts growing. Amen? However, when we become more mature Christians... And we, re- we have to realize that our reason for worshiping must, it must go deeper than that. We come to worship the creator of the uni- universe. Why? Because he is worthy, period. You see, when it comes to worship, you can think about it as communing with God. What does that mean? Commune is a very churchy word. Uh, and uh, I-, I-, I suggest to you the word communicate with God. Talking to God in worship and listening to God in worship. I didn't say just listening to me preach. You're also in your mind praying when you're reading your Bible, talking to God, listening to him. We should come to worship God, to praise him, to thank him, to honor him. But in the end, it's all about knowing God. Acknowledging him as creator of all and acknowledging his wonderful presence in our lives. It's about hearing his voice in the midst of a world in confusion and fear and seeing his beautiful eyes and feeling his touch and his embrace as he guards us from the dangers of this world. When you, when you worship God because God is God, I guarantee you that your worship experience will change. When our, our minds are focused on God, our worship experience will change. I'm going to go through that one very quickly. Why do you come to worship? Answer that question for yourself. Is it just, I've been doing this for 20 years, so, you know, if I don't go, I feel weird. Okay. But it has to go deeper than that, my friends. We have to come to the simple truth that I worship God at church, at home, because he is God. Period. Now, my next question, this one, I get, I have a little bit of fun with this question. The question is, I don't know if you've ever asked this to yourself, why is worship sometimes boring? Ooh, did you just say that? Yeah, I said it. Why is worship sometimes boring? I know young people have, have this, and it's like, this guy's like 85 years old, and uh, he doesn't know what I'm going through in my life. I've said that. I admit it. I mean, I, I've been there. I've been there. You know, you can have two people sitting and listening to the same, same sermon, it's sitting right here. After it's done, you ask this person on the left, so how was church today? It was, I mean, it was, it was terrible. I mean, this guy, he's not a preacher. He should just go somewhere and he doesn't know how to present it, you know? He's not dynamic. Uh, I'm not sure. He, he talked about something like, I think it was entitled Back to Worship or something. Uh, it, was, it was okay. Then there's a person sitting right next to them. You ask them the same question. So how was church today? Oh, it, was, it was great. I, I, the music it really lifted me. Lifted me to the courts of heaven. And praying that day and be, being with my, my fellow believers, oh, it, was, it was wonderful. Why the vast difference of opinion? And yeah, yeah, even the sermon was great. Oh, it's good. Why the vast difference of opinion? Ellen, Ellen White, in my favorite book of hers, Christ's Object Lesson, says, There are those that will receive the truth, but will not be able to understand it. There are some of us that go to church for all the wrong reasons. Our mind is in some other place. We are not focused on the Lord, and we are thinking about everything else because we are so preoccupied by the devil. Now, there's a couple of excuses I want to run through very quickly. When I say quickly, I mean very quickly because I'm mindful of the time. One excuse that I've heard young people say, and even some older folks, I don't really talk a lot, and they don't, I guess the older people don't admit it as much as the younger people do, but you might have thought the same thing. They say, hey, 
the pastor didn't really prepare properly today, you know? He, he, and you know what? He's just not right. It, it, it was his fault. He didn't prepare. He didn't pray about it. He didn't think about it properly. And that's why church is the way it is. To you, I, I, I quote Philippians chapter 1. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me. We're going to look at it, and I'm going to leave it at that. And you can digest that. Philippians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says in verse 15, starting in verse 15, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. You see, God is that awesome that although this vessel that, that, that went up in, in pretense, trying to make themselves look better, God took that vessel and that vessel and said, because you are receptive, because you want to hear my truth, although these words that are coming out is from a prideful mouth, I will have the Holy Spirit form this, and when it hits you, you'll know. You'll know. So even then, Christ is preached. Amen? Number two excuse is, the sermon is not for me. Common one. It's not for me. This one's about marriage. I'm not getting married. This one's about dating. This one's about uh, depression. I'm not depressed. I'm, I'm, I'm not depressed. Come on. It's not for me, so, you know, it, not for me. You see, the question again is coming back to what's in it for me? What's in it for me? You see, if the question was, what can I learn about God from this sermon, from this music, from this prayer, from this hymn? When we understand it's not about you and that it's about God, we can understand that even in depression, God cares for this human, this minuscule human, that even though you're going through one of the toughest times in your life and you just can't seem to get out of it, that God wants to lift you up out of that pit because he loves you. Did you learn something about God that day? Yeah, you did. And the thing is, if it has to do about God, it has something to do with your life. Amen? If it has to do with God, it has to do with your life. And we think that we have these thoughts just because. I suggest to you that the devil is at work. You see, even here, when we allow the devil to get into our minds, he doesn't want you to be blessed. He doesn't want you to receive a blessing, although God is looking to give it to you. He wants you to be distracted, either with your phone, either with your, the person sitting next to you, or something that's on your mind that happened during the week. He doesn't want you to listen. We are thinking about everything else. And on top of that, we often are so far from God during the week. We think, oh, if we go to church today, yeah. all right, yeah. No bricks are hitting me. Come on, pastor. Come on, hit me. Come on. And the pastor didn't hit me today. We expect after all that time that we spent away from God during the week, we come here and sit in this pew and boom. Oh, yeah, I, now he woke me up. And then when it doesn't happen, we complain. The sermon was boring. See, the problem's not solely with the speaker. It's with us. We bring nothing to the table. We have gone the entire week without God. We didn't take a moment to talk to him or to learn more about him from his word. Yet when we come to church, we expect to, we expect to have some sort of epiphany. We're only touched by the emotion of the speaker. The words, the thoughts, the points don't make an impact on us. We just want the person that's dynamic. And you may be thinking, oh, really? But it's this simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Plain and clear, my friends. Plain and clear. How can you and I understand something spiritual when we have no longing to be spiritual? Let me read it from the Word. 1 Kings 2, verse 13 and 14. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. 
because they are spiritually discerned. How can we understand something we don't care to understand? How can we understand the speaker or the music and allow those words to sink into our minds, into our brains, when it's all gibberish? It's a language we do not speak. It is a language we do not understand. But we expect the pastor and the musicians and those up front to somehow instill the desire for us to be religious and spiritual. It doesn't come from people up here. It comes from a quiet time with you and God in that closet. And I'm going to preface this because, again, like I said, I can't make general statements, but I do want to give you a little disclaimer. Yes, there are those that come and one time they come to church. Their whole lives are changed by one sermon. Doug Batchelor, if you know who he is, one of uh, the renowned Adventist preachers of our day, in a cave. He, was, he didn't care for God at the time, but he had this little opening. He said, okay, and his life changed. People like Ron Halverson went from being a gang member to one of the best well-known preachers of our day. Yes, I know it happens. I'm not discounting that at all because God is so awesome. He breaks the people you think could never be broken. People who stand against him, i.e. Paul, and he makes them be his best disciple. But then there's the majority of us. 24 years I've been in the church. I've been alive 24 years. Yeah, sometimes there's those of us We just go through the motions. And the thing is, we have been going to church regularly most of our lives, but why have we not seen the importance of worship? You see, your degree, your doctorate, your master's does not certify you to understand the things of God. Unfortunately. Even your master's in divinity It comes from quiet time with God, worshiping Him to understand the things of God. So you ask the question, is it because God doesn't want to touch me today? He doesn't want to touch my life? No. No. It's we who choose to be untouched. All right? So that was question number two. Only two more questions left. I'm going to let you guys go after that. Next question. Who or what is at the heart of your worship? Who or what is at the heart of your worship? From that story I told you in the beginning about Soul Survivor, from that experience in that band that no longer got to play anymore, there was a man by the name of Matt Redman. Matt Redman was one of the leaders in the band. He was upset when the music was taken away because that was his job in the morning. But this experience drove him to write the song, Heart of Worship. Anyone know that song? It came from this experience. And when you have that background to the song, it just, when you hear it again, like when I did it, just like, wow. He was really moved by the Spirit. He says, when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth. What did I say? The worshiper longs to bring Something of worth that will bless your heart. God's heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. And I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. Worship is not about the music. It's not about the prolific speaker. Sorry, he's not here today. It's not about the big event that everyone's going to be at. Net 2012. It's about Jesus and growing closer to him. Nothing else. Nothing else. Psalm chapter 51, verses 16 and 17. It's that psalm where David is asking God and pleading with him for forgiveness. And he realizes in that moment. And he says, you don't need a sacrifice. That's not what you want. It's not a burnt offering. God, what you desire 
is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. This you will not despise. Are you bringing humility to your worship service? Are you bringing humility to your worship at church, at home, wherever you are? Worship is communing with God, communicating with God. It's not just when you sit down in the pew. I want to go to one chapter, and this is where our um, sermon will wrap up. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 8. I got 10 minutes. Ezekiel chapter 8. Here in this, let me just preface it for you. Here, Ezekiel is taken up into vision, and God is showing him, Ezekiel, do you see what these people are doing in my temple? And in verse 6 of chapter 8 in Ezekiel, God says, Son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go away from my sanctuary. Can you hear the sadness in God's voice? Ezekiel, do you see what they're doing? I, I can't even go to the, my own house. Because I, I have to show you. I just have to show you. I can't tell I have to show you. And God takes him up in the vision and shows him, look. If you jump over to verse 9. Uh, yeah, verse 9. He says, he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw. And in verse 12, he says, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel, elders, you hear me? Do you see what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his own idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Do we come to church? Do you, are you at home sometimes? Do you think that, that God can't see us? Do we do that? And he says, look again. Look again, Ezekiel. Look at, in, in verse 16. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. The Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, there are about 25 men with what? Toward the temple. Their backs toward the temple of the Lord. And instead, their faces were toward the east and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Have you turned your back on God? Have you turned your back on worship? You know, instead of looking to God in worship, we look right here. We look right here. Who, who's that? They've never been. I thought they broke up. Um, oh, he's with her now? What is she wearing? That, that, that dress is too short. Someone has to go talk to her parents. And instead of worship being between us and God, it becomes a contest between us. And we turn, in, in, in essence, we turn our backs away from God. We turn our backs from God. Or maybe the other thing we do, the way we do it is we look at ourselves. You see, it's not vertical anymore, so we make it horizontal. But then we realize, actually, I might as well just look right here, because this looks good. And we look at ourselves. You know, sometimes, I'm not going to pick on any one gender, but I, I don't look, my hair is not done. I'm, I have to be late to church. My appointment with God has to be on hold, because the hair is just isn't right. What are people going to think? And sometimes it gets so late that you come in 10 minutes before the pastor's done. You know? It's like, oh, at least I, I, mean, I came, but at least I look really good. <laughs> Again, it's not vertical. It looks within. And I'm not taking away from the fellowship aspect. That's a good thing. Unfortunately, some churches, what we've done is we made fellowship 99% of what worship is. Just keep a balance. Keep a balance. And I urge you, err on the side of vertical. If we're all looking that way, we'll head the same direction. We'll all head. If all of us start heading toward the center, we'll start coming like this. Amen? If you're looking at yourself and walking, you're going to trip over something. Right here. You see, the center of worship at Babel was self, not the Savior. The center of worship at the foot of Sinai was a golden calf 
and not our glorious king. The center of worship at Mount Carmel was Baal and not God's beloved. The center of worship of Solomon was wealth and women and not the wonderful counselor. The center of worship of the Pharisees was the law, not love. The center of worship of the youth of today is appearance, not the almighty. For some others, even the older folks, it's possession, position, prestige, power, and not the powerful prince of peace. Sex, self, and sin, and not the selfless savior from sin. It seems we're not much better off today. Still getting distracted, but I hope that will change today. I hope that will change. Sometimes, <laughs> when we used to have worship at Real Word, just last year, I used to call people and say, hey, you should come, just come to Real Word. Come for worship um, that day. Like, oh, yeah, 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 I'll come. Who else is coming? I don't know, uh, this person acts, and uh, Jared is going to be there. Oh, I don't really like him. I don't, I don't want to go. I, I, maybe next time. Or they'll say, the, the common one is, who else is, oh, who is preaching? Who's speaking, who's speaking that day? Uh, uh, this person. Tell me next time. I'll come next time. When did worship become about who is and isn't coming? If the Lord is present, isn't that all that matters? See, we asked the wrong questions. And I thought to myself as I was preparing for this, we should be worshiping just because God is present. Present at church, present at home, present in your car. We should worship just because he shows up. But you ask maybe, how can that be enough just because God is there? How many of you enjoy sports of some sort? Anyone grew up playing sports, like sports? If you don't want to admit, that's okay. I know the cameras are on. What is something you do or take part in just because? No real reason, except you care about this person or thing. And the first thing that came to my mind is sports fans. Sports fans. Since we are in the D.C. area, I will say Redskins fans. To the Redskins fans out there, I ask, out there, okay, out there, not here, out there, why are you so involved with this team? Is it because they win all the time? <laughs> no, it's not that. Is it because they give you money? Is it because they have provided a service to you? You know, carpool, take you to work and things like that. No, it's mainly for the simple reason that they are a home team. They're my team. It's my team. They represent my region, my state. You stand behind them even if they sign Donovan McNabb and even if they go 4-12 and 12 for the season and even if they lose time and time and time again. But somehow they're better in the offseason. We'll talk about them. And you'll keep supporting them because they are your team. See, you're loyal to that team. Your loyalty is unbridled. Even if they lose, you somehow find a way to say, we're still better than that team. It's so important that we watch their dismal games. We even wear their colors on that day. And we even have their names on our backs. Nice jersey. Redskins right here. We wear it proudly, even though they lose. We give this type of loyalty to an entity that has done nothing for us, yet you neglect the God that gave everything for us. From God incarnate to angels to divine power at your disposal. Won't you just worship him because he shows up at church, at home? Just because he's present? Look, there are 32 teams in the NFL, but there are only two teams in the battle between good and evil. Choose God or Satan? It's only two choices. Which team are you a fan of? Are you a fan of both? One day. See, it never happens with sports fans. If you're a Redskins fan, Redskins fan, you despise the Cowboys. You despise the Cowboys. There's no way you like the Cowboys. If you're God's fan, you will hate sin. Two can't go together. Revelation, he says, you're lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out. It's the same in this situation. Choose to worship God. Become his diehard fan. At least his team wins. 
Whose fan are you? Whose fan are you? Folks, the heart of worship should always be Jesus Christ. See, the heart is the powerhouse of the body. The heart gives life to the entire body. And when the heart fails, the body fails. It is the same way with Christ when he's at the heart of our worship. He will give your worship that boost, that life it did not previously have. And the heart needs to be exercised. Amen? Hope you exercise your heart. You have to exercise your worship life. The heart needs to be exercised to be healthy and run efficiently and effectively. We too must exercise our spiritual lives if we want to worship effectively. We must train our heart and our minds because they do not naturally like the things of God. We must train our heart and our mind to understand that are the things that are spiritually discerned. If he's not, Jesus is not the heart of your worship, it's going to be tough. How long can you go on like this, my friends? How long can you just come here because you do it, because you have to, my parents did it, my kids have to go, yada, 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 it doesn't matter. At some point, as we grow in grace, it has to go deeper. It has to be because God is present, and I'm his fan. He's going to show up in town today. I want to be there. I want to be there. How long will we be two and a half hour Christians? I hope that ends today. Last question. I have three minutes or so. Last question. Why is worship important? Why is this guy going on and on and on about this, and he's a little bit over time too, and he's not done? What's the big deal about worship? I'll tell you what the big deal is. Listen up. This is part of the question of who will and will not be saved. You see, worship is an end time message. If you don't believe me, you can turn to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, but you probably memorized that one. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory, glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. It's about who we worship. How many teams are there in the battle between good and evil? Two. Two. Not three. Not, there's not a mixture of both of them. There's only two. Worship the Creator because He is God. What are they doing in heaven? What are they doing in heaven? Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 says, They're crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Isaiah chapter 66 tells us, It shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. All flesh, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Heaven is going to be a tough place to be if you cannot enjoy worshiping God. And you can think of it as an act of mercy that God does not save those who don't want to worship him. Because heaven will be hell for them. God is vying for your worship. Satan wants to steal it away. I ask you today, who is at the heart of your worship today and every day? We cannot linger in the gray area forever. We cannot come to God with just our lips. We should and we must worship him with our hearts because God is God. And he gives us even more reason. He sent his son to die for you so you could be saved. He's recklessly loved us. And he said, I'm going to give you all of me, all of me. Even myself, not just my angels, not just the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you me. And I'm going to recklessly love you because you're worth it to me. The heart of worship at remnant is Jesus. The heart of worship in church is Jesus. At home, it's Jesus. At your AY service, it's Jesus. What's the heart of worship for you today? I like how the hymn writer puts it in hymn number 315, All for a Closer Walk by William Cowper. He says, The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol may be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. 
Friends, God wishes to bless you at every worship service. But this can only become a reality for those of us that are mature Christians that are coming each and every week if we take the time to be tuned into his voice and to understand his language. Preparation for church happens during the week. Preparation for God happens during the week. You don't prepare for heaven in heaven. You prepare for heaven on earth. Be tuned in with him, is my prayer. Then you will truly see that whoever is speaking, whoever is singing, whoever is up front, whatever you may read in the Bible when you're at home, will bless you. Bless you greatly. That's a good one. It will bless you. It's not about what the pastor brings to the pulpit. It's about what you bring to the pew. Worship the Lord because you love him and want to praise him and be closer to him. Strip everything else away because it should be all about Jesus. He is and always should be the heart of worship. The question is, is he? Is he the heart of your worship? Is that why you're here today? If not today, hopefully tomorrow. If not tomorrow, hopefully Sunday when you're at home. I hope we realize that worship is important. And when we start changing the question from what's in it for me to God, it's about you. You see, it's an audience of one, God. Worship is about God. He is the audience. What are you bringing? What is your sacrifice of praise today? If those questions change in your mind, you can't wait to worship God. You won't be able to wait. How many of you want that to be your prayer today? I pray that God will work within us because, oh, our carnal natures just fight it so badly. God, we don't want to worship. I ask you today, I encourage you today, be a fan of God. Be on the team of God. He's going to win. Amen.